Hey everyone. Today I want to walk through a series of questions that you can ask yourself to help you find the best possible targets for iDoor vulnerabilities. Now, just as a reminder, an insecure direct object reference or iDoor attacks the part of an application that uses a unique identifier to pull a larger data set that includes sensitive information. An example of this is when an application takes your user ID and returns your profile page with your user information. If the developers of that application don't validate that you have permission to access that larger data set, then you can leverage another user's ID and access their data. Right? Now, it sounds very straightforward to test, and most labs make it seem that way. Simply get the ID of two different users, and one user tries to access the other user's data. Right? Very, very simple. Unfortunately, in modern applications, it's not that simple. Compensating controls can make it very difficult for bug bounty hunters to test this type of vulnerability. So I want to give you a list of four questions that you can ask yourself to determine what patterns have the greatest likelihood for finding IDOR vulnerabilities. First question is, does this endpoint I'm testing have a different HTTP response based on the identity of the client? Now, for example, a, a login page or a marketing page, they don't need to show different data from a larger data set. They just return a DOM, right? And in most cases, uh, finding this can be differentiated between authenticated and unauthenticated endpoints, but that simplifies it. It's not always the case. If you can rule out authenticated endpoints that do not perform a database query, then you can focus on testing the endpoints that matter within the authenticated app. And more importantly, if you can find unauthenticated endpoints that do perform a database query, it can be a great way to find high value bugs. So that's the worst case scenario for IDOR. Let's move on to uh, the second worst case that makes it almost impossible, but, but not always. Many applications uh, use the client session token to validate their session on the edge of the application before any other data is processed from that request. And in some cases, the session token, while it's validated, uh, the application will establish what's called a user context object, and that will be passed to other functions within the request. In simpler terms, it means the application validates the session token, gets the user ID from that validation, and then queries the database for the larger full user object. And the IDs in the user object are what's used to query any uh, larger data set further, as opposed to the data in the HTTP request itself. Now this eliminates your ability to control the ID value without first stealing the victim session token. And at that point, you've got better things to do, right? You've already won. So once you've determined that the endpoint does not return a unique response based on the client's identity, ask yourself if they're validating that identity by establishing a user context. If so, it can be very difficult to get an IDOR, but there are exceptions. Applications are complicated. They're, they're built by a lot of different people, right? That complexity is where IDORs live. You know, maybe one part of the code was written by a developer that, that didn't use the user context and, and chose to pull the value from a cookie instead, or maybe the user context wasn't passed to a backend service at all, and so it needs a way to identify the client. It finds a different way. You know, if you look for, for cracks in that complexity, and if you fuzz for weird responses, sometimes you can find areas where, where you can get something, but, but don't spend too much time on that. Uh, so next, we have a use case that's probably very familiar. The application validates the client's identity through an ID in the HTTP request, but that ID is signed for integrity, right? You're probably gonna think of a JSON web token for, for how this is implemented. That signature is designed to make sure you cannot modify those IDs. It validates the integrity. So, so what does that mean? It means we need to break the signature validation before we can test for an IDOR. This use case is, is not ideal because developers need to make two mistakes in the same area. They'd have to first fail to validate the, the signature of the JSON web token, and then they'd have to fail to validate the ID itself. The, the likelihood of that is, is pretty rare. But it also means if you find a place where they both fail, you have a chain of two vulnerabilities and you can get a much larger bounty. Uh, technically, this use case, or testing this use case, sorry, is, is very tedious and, and technically challenging, uh, but it can be really rewarding and it's honestly one of my, my favorite ways to test. Uh, it, finally, we have the use case that everyone is familiar with. It's in all the labs. The ID is placed in a parameter accessed by the app and just used to, to pull a larger data set. Uh, it's the best place for IDORs. Like I said, it's what just about any lab is going to demonstrate. However, 
It's also very uncommon in modern, app modern applications and very easy to test. So finding it's going to be really difficult. Uh, you can combine this with uh, heavy recon. Hopefully you can find something that, uh, that somebody hasn't found. So, uh, but those are the four questions that I ask myself when I'm testing for IDORS. Does the endpoint return the same response regardless of the client's identity? Does the endpoint identify the client by establishing a user context? Does the endpoint identify the client through an ID value with a signature? Or best case, does the endpoint simply pull an ID value from a parameter? The closer you get to the bottom of the list, the easier it will be to find an IDOR. So I hope that helps. Uh, I've got another video coming soon with a very exciting DEF CON announcement. So, so please keep an eye out for that. Best of luck. Happy hunting. Cheers.